Guys, everybody, thank you so much for coming today. We we're so excited. We just thought it'd be really fun to have a conversation about sabbaticals, taking time off work. It's something that all of us separately people have asked us about. We've talked about it with each other. And so we thought it'd be fun to just open up like a more public conversation. Um, feel free to put questions in the chat. A lot of questions also came from the Luma link. So a lot of you asked a lot of questions. So we have plenty of stuff to talk about, but we would love to prioritize any questions you have. So feel free to drop them in the chat. If I miss them, if the chat's like moving, feel free to ask it again. Um, but we will try to keep an eye on everything. And that being said, I will introduce the team um, or I'll let them introduce themselves to the people who are here. Um, and we will, you know, we'll, we'll go alphabetically. Cecile, do you want to just give us a little bit of introduction to you and maybe sort of how your sabbatical looked for you? Very happy to. Wow, it's really impressive to see that all of the people who are joining 54, it's lovely to see you all. Um, I'm Cecile, I'm I'm French, I live in London, and um, how, how my sabbatical, sabbatical came about is that I'd been working for quite some time, for a dozen years, um, in corporate, consulting, and I'd been working quite intensely, not because I was forced to, but because I felt like my job was meaningful, and I kind of ended up spending all of, my, all of my energy into work so at some point I kind of felt like whoa I haven't seen the past 10 years they've just flown by and it felt like I just didn't want the next 40 or 50 years to do the same thing so like right time for a break um I'm going to step away from work and think about how I want to shape the next phase of my life a bit more consciously rather than stay on the rail track so that's how that's how I decided to leave. It wasn't that easy a decision to make, but I left for 12 months. And then I can dive into more detail on what I did during those 12 months. So that did include nomading and uh, writing and a lot of things. Um, and then I did, I, I went back to work after those 12 months and came back to work in February of this year. Uh, so it's been almost six months since I returned. Yeah. Thanks, Michelle. Nice, Cecile. And I'll pass it to Matt next. Hey everyone, I'm Matt. I'm currently almost seven months into my sabbatical. Um, bit of background on me, I grew up outside of Washington, DC, went to school in the Bay Area, and then I was in San Francisco. And then for the last three years, I've been living with Adelise, so been bouncing around. I would mark the start of my sabbatical journey in fe as February last year. I read Paul's book, The Pathless Path, so it's, it's cool that we're doing this together now. And then from February 2022, it was 10 months of agony, like one week I would say like, F this, I'm going to quit tomorrow. And then the next week I'd get worried about money. And then it would just like back and forth week after week for 10 months, quit my job at the start of the year. Um, things are great. A lot of unexpected, great, positive things have happened. And then all the worries, concerns, uh, downsides have not been as bad. And uh, I'm sure we'll get into it. So I'll stop there. Nice. I will go next. I'm Michelle. I left my job at the end of 2020. And for about, I would say a year and a half, two years, I was just on a sabbatical, doing my own thing, trying to really figure out the next steps in my life. Um, sometimes I joke that I'm on an indefinite sabbatical because I didn't really have an official end to it, but I did slowly start to take on more freelancing opportunities and doing different things in my communities. So that's what my sabbatical has looked like. Um, I've been living in a small town in like literally the middle of nowhere. Like there is no major city near me for about two hours. So mine has been a little bit different than the nomadic experience, but it's been really rewarding in its own way. And then Paul, do you want to go next? Sure. Yeah. So Paul Millard, uh, I quit my job about six plus years ago tried to become a freelance consultant and quickly realized I'd stumbled on this something uh, completely different, designed a bunch of, or sort of fell into a bunch of non-work sabbaticals over the next two to three years uh, at that time and sort of fell in love with creating space in my life uh, from one month to three or four months of no, no income, no work type things. I've also experimented with taking every seventh week off as a sabbatical and I'm now kicking off a writing sabbatical I'm crafting for myself when I go back to Taiwan in August. Uh, so I think it's like one of the most important things I've stumbled on by accident in my life and uh, over and over again, see that 
almost everyone has positive results from sabbaticals, except one random person I talked to in Pennsylvania once. Oh, wow. That's, that's crazy. I've never heard of anyone who didn't have a good time. She, um, was neutral. she was neutral. It wasn't negative. It was just like, yeah, it was fine. <laughs> that's fair. Toby, do you want to close it, close out the introductions for us? Yeah, of course. Um, hey, everyone. I'm Toby. Um, I'm probably eight or nine months into my sabbatical. Um, so before that, I was working in tech. I was a software engineer. Um, did that for about five years. And honestly, I was probably like done with it maybe halfway through, but I kept on like creating like new excuses to like do like another week, another month, another quarter, you know? Um, and then I got to a point where I was just like, you know, I tried all the different like remedies. So I tried to become a PM. I tried to talk to like a work coach. I tried to talk to like a, like a, some, like a therapist, so just a bunch of different things to try and get out of like the, like the work malaise. Um, and it kept on coming back to the same thing, which is like, I need to make a change with how I'm spending my days. And then, yeah, I eventually made the decision to like quit. Um, I didn't have like a like a master plan. I didn't actually call this a basketball. I was just like, I'm quitting. Um, I'm going to Barcelona um, and I'm going to figure it out from there. And then, and yeah, <clears throat> I feel like it's been an incredible, incredible journey so far. I started writing. I feel like I've kind of found something that I've, I, I really enjoy. And so, and so, yeah, here I am. So yeah, it's been an incredible journey so far. Nice. And uh, it would be really great to hear from you guys if you want to put in the chat, like, are you considering a sabbatical? Are you on a sabbatical right now? Um, are you coming back from a sabbatical? It'd be really helpful just to get some context if you guys are open to sharing, like what you're, where you are and what stage you're in, because um, we can help do that as well. And just so you guys know, this conversation is being recorded. So we will be sending out a recording afterwards, barring any problems or issues with technology. And to kick off a question that came up a lot and actually is one that I don't have a great answer to because I lost my job. So I didn't actively quit my job, but a lot of people were asking, how did you like leave your job? How did you make that decision? What did that look for you, look like for you? Um, I think a lot of people are in that stage where they're maybe ready to take a sabbatical, but they're still feeling tied to their own position. So I'd be curious to know what that looked like for each of you. I can start. Um, as for me, I mentioned, I first read The Pathless Path. I remember midway into the book, I, I started journaling too. So I could actually can find the exact day where I was like, I'm reading this book. I think I'm going to quit my job and like not have everything lined up. But like I said, it took 10 months. And so during those 10 months, every time I read some other article or book that was somehow about sabbaticals or not even sabbaticals, like work, meaning of life, philosophy, that type of stuff. I would just like pin it and then it ended up turning into like a notion guide. There's just a bunch of links. And yeah, it was just a lot of inner dilemmas and back and forths in my head. At the same time, this is also, I was already pretty detached from work. I knew it wasn't, I wasn't going to be a PM for the rest of my life. So I started to slowly, which really work less and less, felt more and more distant from my work. And then in my day-to-day -day physical life, I was living in Hawaii. I was doing road trips. I was like basically going ham on life outside of work because I felt so such a lack of fulfillment in my job. I was like, I don't want to just be a blob and sit at home. Let me try and find meaning elsewhere. So I lived in Hawaii for six months, gone into surfing, spent five weeks in the summer driving around, sleeping in my car, camping. I was in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, where they don't have any Starbucks that close at like 6 or 7 p.m. So I would take my evening meetings at Whole Foods in the cafeteria thing where they have like the microwave if you want to heat up your frozen meals. And then, yeah, I basically just tried everything. By the time I actually quit at the end of the year, it felt like I had no other options. Looking back, in the moment, it felt like a really hard decision. I feel like I Cecile would be great because she like, really intentionally went after it yeah it was about that thanks paul i was about to to jump in because my story is very is is quite different from the one that you've just described matt so i mentioned in my intro i did actually really like my job um if anything i i liked it too much um i found a lot of meaning from my work kind of working for the energy transition and just had been doing that for years and just felt like i was doing good and important work and the problem is that I kind of picture it in my head as like there was this one big anchor 
in my life that was work and that was the solid anchor that I was tied to and I kind of look and then the other anchors I just didn't really see them and then I when you look at that and you you're, you're tied to this one thing that keeps you driven in one direction and afloat you're like what if this disappears then what happens like I actually don't know um if that guy is tough if that um tie is cut then I'm gonna go completely adrift like oh okay so I kind of thought right I actually want to strengthen the stuff that's outside of work work is not the meaning of life <laughs> I actually want to um work to be able to live rather than live to work and uh and that's kind of why uh I started having those those thoughts coming into my head I'm like all right I need to take a break and then a couple of things happened that really pushed me um over over the edge because it's it's quite hard to decide to just okay I'm going to cut that tie and then see what happens um but I had a bit of a health scare not like burnout as per, per se but there was a something that took me out of work for two months and a bit of a I ended up being quite well quite conscious that my ended how much my identity was tied to my job like right I'm not working for two months I'm now ill not able to do much um who am I not quite sure <laughs> Um, so this is the kind of stuff. And then there's other things that I describe in some of my some of my articles, but it felt like there's a few signals like this that came one after the next that then ultimately pushed me towards the right. I just I just need to go. And I remember distinctly the moment that really made me tip over the edge, which was that I at some point I came to the point where I was thinking, right, if not now, then when? am I going to do this? Like, I keep thinking about those things. And it's been a few months, well, weeks, months that I've been thinking about this, but I could keep thinking about it, weighing the pros and cons for months, probably years. And it feels like now is the right time. My big project is coming to an end. My partner can also leave um, his work or just take it with him. And we can do that together. If not now, then when? And that's when I put in my, not resignation, I actually did a, a formal like typical sabbatical from from my company I put the sabbatical in sabbatical request and then and they granted me that that request um so yeah that's that's how it came that's how it came about Toby do you want to chime in as well because I know you wrote a little bit about leaving a role and sort of the decisions behind that yeah, yeah, I can go in. Um, mine is a bit kind of similar to Matt's. So I feel like I was, you know, in this role, um, I was, I definitely became the, like the blob that Matt was trying not to be, <laughs> where I was just like, you know, going through the motions, um, just like performative stuff of work, you know, just like playing the game, like doing the stand up, all that kind of stuff. Um, but it just, I just, I felt like I kept on coming back to the same thing, um, where I was just like, I really don't like this, you know, I, and like, I would make these excuses of like, okay, you know, it's a it's a good job, it's good money, I get stock options, blah, blah, blah. But then kind of similar to what Cecile said, it's like, I was really curious about doing this. And I was like, you know, I, I'm like, I'm 29, I'm having no kids and a wife. I was like, I have the opportunity to like do this right now with like no dependence. Um, and I remember there's this critical moments where like we were going through planning. So like through planning season, basically, you know, trying to figure out what to do for the next year or the new product products and features. And I'd become so like pessimistic and jaded where like they would say like a new product idea and I just instantly start thinking about all the ways it's going to fail, all the ways it's like not going to work. And I remember thinking I can't go through another planning cycle because I'm just not in the right like headspace to like basically work on any like new initiative. Um, and so I, I feel like it still was a gradual process because I had to like, you know, there's there's like the things you know, like logically or rationally, but then there's things that like, you kind of have to clear yourself into. And so I started talking to people, um, people who had done similar things. One of my best friends had quit his job a couple of months before. I talked to Simo, uh, just a bunch of people who had done like similar things. And like once I kind of um, made myself comfortable with the fact that like, okay, what's the worst that could happen? Like, okay, if I, if I do this for a bit, you know, I could get another job. It might not be the sexist job. It might be, you know, it might look different, but I could get another job again. I got this one, you know, all these skills. I can still like interview and do that stuff. And um, I, I think I was also really like worried about like, uh, this is kind of deep, but like I, I had a friend who like passed away like in a couple of years before. Um, and I just had this visual of like, if I fast forward to like, you know, me in the future and like looking back and like, I really didn't want to have that regret to be like, oh, you know, I really want to do that thing. But like I stayed for these reasons that are like, not really pop, like they, they don't mean much, you know? And I felt like I could live with the fact that, okay, I quit my job 
I tried something else. Maybe it worked, maybe it didn't work, but at least I gave it a go. I felt like the the regrets I would have dealt with if I just kept this in my in my heart as an idea and never tried it out would have been much harder to um to deal with. So I was like, okay, well I'm gonna do it. And you know, I and then I and then I quit and I bought the ticket and then I kept buying more tickets and then <laughs> and then we're here. So um so yeah, that's kind of how I got here. Yeah. I, th I think one thing worth adding is I often see before sabbaticals, there's either a desire to escape, which almost everyone has this desire to escape, uh, at least a little bit. Uh, but there's also this like leaning toward wonder, which is like, what might happen if, um, and even if it's a small feeling, it's usually that feeling which you're chasing, which is really hard to wrap your head around because for many of us in this conversation, it's often a shift away from this, like, I know what I'm doing in life toward following this feeling might mean I don't know what I'm doing and everyone else around me will see I don't know what I'm doing. So this is sort of what happened to me. When I quit my job, I was trying to escape a job. And in the first six months, I like paid for my living doing consulting work, but there was enough space that I was like wandering around doing some writing stuff that didn't quite make sense. And I was like, Ooh, this is interesting. What if I didn't work for three to four months <laughs> for paid for money? Um, and that thought was so like sexy to my mind that I was like, I have to follow that thought. Um, and that was the first thing that, um, pulled me toward doing a sabbatical and that feeling kept growing over time. I think like Toby was saying, uh, so I think that's something we're saying. And like, now I realize like creating that space is necessary in my path. It is like the most important thing. It's like first, foremost, and central to like everything that flows downstream creatively from that. I really resonate with that. Like, I think for me, my story is more, I was getting close to losing my job, ended up losing my job. So I was very anxious after I left my work. I knew I wanted a break, but I didn't really know what that meant for me. And I think that as my, as I've had some time to like think and self-reflect, I realized how I really shifted from like a scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset. Because I think when you're leaving your job or even when, like, I didn't want to lose my job. I like had my nails deep in and it was like I don't you know I'll make this work even though it wasn't really going well but I realize now that there's so much opportunity in the world new job opportunities there's opportunities created by the internet there's opportunities created when you meet new people um, and yet I think it's so easy for us to get so you know we want to stay with the thing that we know and we're like well this pays my bills this gets me health insurance this might be doing all of these things for me if I leave, how do I know that those other things will be there for me? And I think part of it is kind of shifting into an abundance mindset and saying, what if I leave and there, there is more out there for me, whether it's monetary, whether it's, you know, spiritual or internal. So I think that's a really, a really interesting point that I really resonate with. Um, I, I do, Michelle, if I may, I, I do want to jump in on that because um, that's where the leap of faith comes in for me. So I was very much like you, scarcity mindset, wanted to move towards an abundance mindset, not really knowing that that's what I wanted to do. But the thing is, if you don't take that leap of faith towards a world where you absolutely have no idea what you're doing and you're just following your curiosity, if you don't do that, then you won't have opportunities to follow your curiosity and you won't discover in awe or in wonder all of those things that create that that reality of abundance that's out there so you have to make that leap of faith to go figure out what abundance means to you in a way and how it expresses itself in the world and that's quite scary um yeah I think that's a good jumping off point too to this question that Betty asked which is how do you all answer what do you do when you're on your sabbatical and I think that's a an interesting when you're going through all of this and then somebody's asking you to define it, it can be definitely really tough. So I'm curious to know how you guys have answered that question and how that has evolved over time. I, th I think, I think this one is... of the guys on sabbatical should take, oh, sorry, Paul. <laughs> I mean, I'm still trying to answer this. I often tell people have a boomer compatible script, have a uh, normie compatible script, and then have a find the others compatible script. 
And like my big solution was basically just to like go to places like Bali and other digital nomad locations where you're grandfathered in as uh, uh, find the others friends, Laura Lynn. Um, I, I basically just went to digital nomad locations where like not having a sensible work script made sense. Um, so, and hang out online. So yeah, it, it's really hard because it's going to trigger the hell out of you and you have no idea. Matt or Toby, do you guys have any thoughts? Yeah. yeah, I can go. So leading up to quitting my job at the end of the year, I was telling my friends, oh, I'm going on a career break. I'm taking a career break. I even wrote a blog that used the word career break everywhere. But then maybe a couple months in, I realized that wasn't the right term because a break implies that I'm going to return to whatever the break was. And also a break is like a period of rest when I felt like I knew I was working harder than when, when I left because by the time I left, I was like not trying at all and just... I was like an OG quiet quitter before that term started showing up in the New York Times. And um, yeah, then then I felt like I should use the word career transition, but then the, the, everyone would ask like, what are you transitioning to? And at this point, I still don't even know what's what's next. Uh, I'm grateful that I have still a decent amount of runway left, but I do, yeah, now I just use the word sabbatical. It's, it's convenient. I think there's certain nuances that it misses, but um, I, I say I write a blog, a personal blog. I write a climate newsletter. And I do a podcast with a friend. And then um, the neat thing is I have friends through different, like maybe through one of each of these projects, but then they don't know me in the other ways. So I feel like I'm living mul multiple lives at once, which is kind of cool. Um, but even outside of those three projects, which are things that I produce stuff out of, I spend the majority of my time reading and learning. So it's cool that like people will be like, oh, I read your climate newsletter. That's like your main thing. But then actually... Uh, in reality, I'm spending a lot of time doing other stuff. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I can go in. It's It's been definitely a journey as well. So I think initially I used to say like recovering engineer, um, but then I kind of like mixed that because again, that kind of implies that like recovering is like, you know, something was wrong with me, <laughs> you know? Uh, which may be true, but I just didn't want to like, lean into that. Um, and then I, I was saying like ex-engineer, and then at a certain point, I was like kind of saying traveling, but then people can kind of really saw that to me like I was on vacation. And so like that kind of gave the wrong connotation because I was like, I'm traveling, but like I'm still like working on projects. I'm still like, you know, I'm not just like, you know, partying the entire time. Um, and then at a certain point, I started like trying to um, toy with the label of being a writer and you, and then that comes up with a bunch of different questions. And like, so now it, it kind of depends on the context, honestly. Um, I think more, more recently I've been saying, yeah, more sabbatical. And then that kind of leads to a couple more questions and then people get the gist of it. Um, but like, if it's like, I, I also just like come up with like silly answers, like in a pinch, like in a bar or something like, oh, I just like a one-off answer. Um, but I think on sabbatical um, is probably like the closest. I, I've also used the one Matt came up with, like I'm on transition, but I'm not really sure what I'm transitioning to. And then that can release a couple of questions as well, you know, about like, what are you doing? You know, how do you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I think the term, like the term of the notion of a sabbatical career break is just so foreign and like, I, it's like, guys, it's just like, so people just don't understand what's going on. And like, you know, I knew like coming back to San Francisco, I was there like last week, one of my friends was like, hey, like, just make sure you're not like super sensitive because you're going to get a couple of questions that might trigger you. Like, oh, you're chilling or you're like not working or you're just like kind of, and I'm like, no, I'm actually working, like like Matt said, I'm actually working more than I was, to be fair, like when I had a job towards the end where I was just like, like uh, presenting like I was working, but like I wasn't, I wasn't super curious. I wasn't trying to improve, you know, um, but like the, like the vocabulary doesn't really exist. So I just kind of try to not get too sensitive about that. No, it's, you know, they, they don't really know um, how to like deal with the, with the notion and um just gonna say yeah, I'm a sabbatical and I and like I'm working on projects and I'm trying to see where that goes. And it's it's kind of funny. You can be you can kind of um take that scary question and turn it into a fun question as well after you know once you're done being scared with it. Um and you can turn it into just an interrogation for you to be curious about. So if someone asks you one day, so what do you do? And you can actually see whatever it is, just feel into whatever it is that comes up in the moment and kind of go like, oh, at the moment, I'm 
doing X or I'm feeling like this. And at some point you might say, I'm reading this book or I'm taking dance classes, I'm going on a retreat or whatever it is. And you, the, the thing that is fun is that you can actually almost test different facets of your identities in your response. So you test that part of your identity that you're developing or another one. It depends on who you've got opposite you, but then it does become a bit like, like a game where you can say, introduce an aspect of your of your identity that you're developing and almost even test how it resonates with you as you see it as you as you say it to the other person and you see the reaction and I found it quite interesting after a while I quite liked people asking me what do you do when I was on sabbaticals because it actually helped me figure out what it was that I cared about I love that reframe and I think you know the truth is is that if you like people will ask you and it may trigger you. And if it doesn't, you're definitely a more enlightened person than I am. Like, I think I didn't realize how much of my identity was attached to my work and it's, it's okay. Like, I think you do get more comfortable answering that question. Part of the reason I shifted to sabbatical was I would just tell people I wasn't working or, you know, I'd be like, oh, I lost my job or I'm not working. And then they would try to find, they'd be like, oh, well, I, you could be in there like an assistant for me. Or there's, they'd send me job postings. I was like, no, this isn't, I'm also not trying to work. I'm just, I'm not working, but by choice, I'm just going to keep doing that. So I sort of found the word sabbatical and I was like, perfect. That kind of tells people a little bit more finite that I'm, I'm not working, but it, it, it adjusts every day. I feel like I change it too. And I agree with Cecilia, like, you kind of start to have more fun with it. And people, a lot of people are very curious too, because people in my life outside of the internet are like, oh, I didn't realize I could take time off. Um, all that being said, a really interesting question was, do you guys think that travel in a, is an essential part of taking a sabbatical? Is it possible to take an effective sabbatical without travel? And if you think it's essential, what makes it so? So, I will kick off really quick and say that I did not travel that much, or I definitely didn't travel anywhere exotic. I traveled around the US if something came up, but it wasn't, I had no interest in it. I had traveled when I was younger and I like knew I wanted to like focus on doing some self-reflection and kind of doing a career pivot during my time off. So I would say it's not essential at all. I live in probably the most boring place in the United States and it's been a really positive experience for me. So in that sense, I will say, um, I don't think it's essential, but I'm curious to know a lot of you all have traveled and what your thoughts are on that. Or maybe I I'll took even... my, I took my first like created sabbatical in Boston. And I think in that, I actually realized I needed to leave the US. <laughs> I, I think I was just pulled to kind of be in a different place or at least leave Boston because like Boston is just like a very like full-time work centered or academia town and I just like didn't have many friends there so I think I wanted to travel to kind of just explore and uh, meet some different people so I ended up taking future sabbaticals abroad. I think we all traveled, right? Toby, Matt, um, me, as well as as Paul, apart from you, Michelle. I think I, I learned, uh, I think there is value in traveling and I think there's value in not traveling too much. So I do want to make the distinction between the two. So I, I'll, I'll make the distinction by calling it, by calling one traveling and the other one nomading, whether that's right or not, you know, I, it's just the definitions that I use. But the way that I see traveling is like you're you're going to another place and you're there to almost consume the place in a way. You like to check it out and you experience it and then you move on to somewhere else. You've got tick the box and you 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 go somewhere else. The problem that there is with with traveling, I have found because I did that in my first three months of sabbatical. I went to Mexico three months, but it wasn't three months in the same place. It was one week here, three weeks there, another week there, four weeks there, and actually it takes a lot of time to settle in. And in order to find your, just figure out where to buy food that you like, where you want to walk in places that you like. And it takes a lot of mental bandwidth, at least for me it did, to settle into a routine where creativity could then flow. When I was traveling, creativity was hard to find, for me at least. So I ended up 
needing, feeling the need to not travel that much and to stay put a bit longer, which is what I did in the second part of my sabbatical when I went to Indonesia and stayed almost six months in the same place, truly letting the environment that I was in transform me rather than me coming in and checking everything out. It's like me coming in and letting in Indonesia, it's like letting just nature that's absolutely overwhelming all around you you have to live within the rhythm of nature. The sun rises, you're up with the sunrise, or at least I am, because it, it comes through the windows and there's no way to avoid it. So it's up, it 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 goes down at six. So at eight, I feel sleepy and I already kind of want to, to wind down for the night. So, and there's nature, animals, bugs, absolutely everywhere. And all of this kind of stuff happens to you and your nervous system gets used to a different way of living. And that's for me when different ways of thinking being started showing up so that's the value that I found in nomading rather than than traveling it's not to say that you can't do that when you're staying at home I think you can but you have to be a lot more intentional about letting about finding ways out of your normal routine if you're staying where you are to get the environment to invite you to do something else than what you're usually what you're used to yeah, I agree with what Cecile said. It depends. It could be successful either way, or it could be positive for you, whether you travel or not. I nowadays, so I spent three years without a lease. Now I'm trying to be based in New York and I'm trying to actually travel less. Uh, but most of the travel the past three years has been a slower type of travel. I think of travel nowadays as like commuting, where you have a goal or a purpose and it just happens to be somewhere that you're not currently at. And so you have to go there. And so, I don't know, in the traditional sense, before Zoom and before remote work, you would have to go to the office to do your job. And then now if you're in, on sabbatical, you don't have a job, but like, think about what you need in your life. It might be like rest. It might be like a yoga retreat. It might be um, investing more time in a surfing hobby or something where you have to do it somewhere else. And so I would go travel to these places. I would go, for the last three years, I've traveled to the West and skied at these big mountains. But when I'm doing that, I don't really think of myself traveling because traveling is secondary. The primary thing is the, the purpose of that particular trip. Paul, were you gonna say something? Yeah, I think uh, I've lived in 35 different placings, places for at least a week in the last six years. And one thing, both me and my wife have noticed is like how dumb our bodies are. We're just, we just start doing different stuff based on where we live, how our apartment's located, um, how much light you get in your place, like what is close by of what you're doing. And so I have just gotten a lot more humbled by like the environment I'm in and thinking about that. So I think thinking about the environment can be very uh, powerful in terms of shaping the kind of experience you want. And basically just changing variables will change how you're behaving. And for me, like changes information. And that can be super valuable when you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, it's really about what works best. Like it's about knowing yourself and checking in with yourself. And I think a common theme is if it was working, it was working. And if changes needed to make, be made, like the nice thing about being on a sabbatical is that a lot of times you do have that flexibility to make changes. I think an additional question that's been coming up that's a part of all of this that would be interesting to hear for me as well is how did you guys think about structuring your sabbatical? Did you have structure in your sabbatical? Did it come later? Like how, that's a question that's come up a lot is like what how do you how do you get the most out of it? How do you structure it? What did that look like for you? Who's gonna go? I go for it. I can start. Um, okay, so for mine, and I think every Sabasco is different, there's like different needs. Um I definitely needed like a rest and healing phase. Um, so like the first maybe three weeks or so when I was in Barcelona, I very much gave myself the license to just try and play, whatever the hell that means. Just like, you know, I didn't want to add like a lot of structure to my calendar. I wanted to be able to just like walk like 
roam the streets and like I actually wasn't trying to do the touristy stuff I just wanted to like get lost and just kind of you know oh well, what is that thing just kind of roam around play football just like you know eat, eat tapas all that kind of stuff um I didn't know how much I needed to like rest or heal because I think again towards the end of my my job I was like, depressed and it was just like a really like dark time and so I kind of knew I needed some time for this but I I don't know I didn't know how to like diagnose it was like is it one week or two weeks or whatever um so that was like the first piece I also did like a writing course um Foster I see Karen is here that, that kind of gave me a bit of like um structure to like you know have something that I was working towards so at the beginning it was kind of like traveling and like writing were the first um things I was trying to do and then I started working on a couple of projects with friends so there was a point where I was working on like three different things and like I would kind of roughly break up my week into um, working on those different projects. Um, and actually this goes into the, the past answer about travel. So the times where I was in the place longer where I was able to have my routine on deck and like, you know, you know the, the, the nearby cafe, like, you know, my routes, it was much easier to like stay in my structure. But the times where I was like in a place for one week or as a place for like, you know, a bit less, I felt like, I would get to the new place and I would feel like my, I have to restart my routine or I'd have to like figure out things again and that might kind of throw me off balance. Um, so I think the general, like the general like outlook has been, initial bit was like rest, rejuvenation, healing, and there was like an experimentation, you know, creative exploration kind of phase. And then, um, I'm, which I'm still in to some degree. And then I imagine there's some point about, okay, like trying to take some of those explorations into making money um but initially not putting a lot of pressure into the idea that this must like replace like my previous income so like you know because there, there there's also dangers of monetizing hobbies or things too quickly which i want to be mindful for it um i don't want to like just be like oh my god i found a thing and then just pour my all my all my effort into that but i also don't want to earn zero dollars so it's somewhere in between um and then i imagine at some point which i'm not there yet um I would have enough signal uh, where I'm like able to land the plane effectively. Like I'm going to know, okay, these are the things I've learned that I enjoy doing. These are the things I've learned that I can do creatively that also bring some income and I want to invest more in that. And I'm like going to be hyper-focused on those things. Um, so I think that's the general outlook of the structure. Obviously I'm still somewhat in between and I can't see the future, um, but I feel like that's probably the way it's kind of going to go, I guess. Yeah, I think it's 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 a really interesting question. Um, and there's there's two levels to it, I see. And Toby, I think you described for what what I call like the meta level, the meta structure of the sabbatical. Um, I usually describe it, and I think I've got like uh, talk about you know resting, healing as you describe it for the first whatever however long it takes you. Then you kind of move to experimenting, playing around, whatever you want to call this, and then you land. And I quite like it, it's quite funny that you used the the metaphor of a plane Toby this is one that I really like using as well where you end up kind of taking off at the beginning and you kind of go straight ahead into resting you're cruising you're fine and then when you're exploring you're kind of changing suddenly you're changing a wing to the plane or you're changing this window in the back and then all those windows in the front you're changing the seats you're changing the engine progressively throughout all your explorations and then you have to figure out how to land this thing and it's completely different to <laughs> the plane that you actually took off with so like whoop, okay um, and that phase, that last phase is, is an interesting one to, to explore. But that's for me, the kind of the meta structure. But then there's also the micro structure of on a day to day basis. How is it that you structure your days, your weeks um, and then ultimately your months? And I think on that front, for me, in the very beginning, I was very intentional about not having a structure. Um, I was intentional about setting intentions to explore certain things so make sure that I I wanted to make sure that I exercised whether it was walking or whatever so that was one important thing I wanted to make sure I spent time in the sunshine so that was an important thing it didn't really matter when I did it during the day but the, the structure was more like those things matter to me I want to spend time and energy doing them and then slowly when I moved into the exploration phase that kind of changed because I started getting interested in multiple projects at the same time Sometimes I'd have, I don't know, six or seven things running at the same time. Other times I'd have like one big project that really did matter hugely to me. And the structure of my days and my weeks would change depending on how many things and how intense those things were for me. 
And I really played it by ear, um, making sure that the way that I spent my days was aligned with what I truly wanted to do. And that was the exercise that I kind of went through throughout my whole exploration phase, making sure that I don't structure my days to kind of coerce myself into working on those, say, six projects or those six projects at the same time, but that I kind of find ways of inviting myself to focus on this one and then on that one. But if I didn't want to focus time on this one because I didn't feel like it in the moment, that was fine. So the there's a there's an interesting uh, question in the in the chat about how much non-coercion was a crucial part of your sabbatical. For me, it was. I think the only thing I tried to, even to the point where I tried to not coerce myself into focusing on non-coercion, <laughs> and sometimes I would end up like coercing myself for three weeks to work on this specific project. It's just um, so I. All in all, I don't think there's a a go-to structure that will work on a daily basis or weekly basis for everyone. And it's something that you have to figure out for yourself and that will change throughout the entire sabbatical. But that's good because you get to explore what works for you by trying a lot of things out. Yeah, I think I have a couple of things to say because unlike Toby and Steele, I feel like I went at it completely the opposite direction. So leading up to my sabbatical, I had the plan to launch my climate newsletter and also this podcast that's unrelated that my friend asked me to be the co-host for. So I was getting ready to quit. I was pre-writing some climate newsletters. We had pre-recorded some podcasts and we were going to launch all of this in January, which is when I started my sabbatical. And looking back, basically I, in giving up my job, became my own boss and I would just sort of like manage myself, which didn't work because... I spent at least a year at my job before I quit, just losing the ability to be motivated and work hard. So in hindsight, I needed to rest, but I think this is all in hindsight, you get clarity. Um, basically, I think working hard and being motivated is a muscle. And if you don't exercise it, it atrophies. And so I didn't feel burnt out, but I think I lost the ability to work hard on things I care about. And it really just felt like a grind the first three or four months. Um, I was just in my head. I would remember I would go to Google Calendar and it's just me because I'm not working. I don't schedule meetings. I wasn't talking to people and I would time block every day. And then I would consistently not do what was on the time block and get kind of pissed at myself and lay on the couch and scroll on TikTok. And so honestly, I think the first three months of my sabbatical was learning how to be disciplined and motivated to wake up every Monday morning, every Tuesday morning, read, write, do what I want. Um, and then now I feel like, now I feel like I don't have this problem, but it took a while to learn. And a question I ask myself is like, what would this look like if it was just more fun, if it was more enjoyable? And also, if you think about it, if you're on sabbatical working on your own stuff, you should want to do it. It sounds so obvious, but like, if you're not having fun doing it, then uh, that's worth like keeping a pulse on and, and paying attention to. Yeah, it was very similar to Matt, especially since I hadn't really planned for mine until, you know, right at the end when I knew I was going to lose my job. And I was in an opposite place. Like I had, I was working really hard at the end of my like sales career because I thought I was going to lose my job. And actually because of that, I was like, oh, I actually have a lot of discipline. I can see how I'm growing over this time. I will easily apply this to my own life and it will work out perfectly and I will be extremely successful. And that was not at all how it was. I agree with Matt. I think in hindsight, I didn't realize that I needed time to rest and I was resting, but I felt very guilty about it. Like if I wasn't, I call it like deprogramming from like the corporate mindset where it's like, if I'm working nine to five, you know, you're like, oh, if I'm not waking up early in the morning and I'm not working 40 hours a week, then I'm not productive and I don't really have an identity and who am I like, you know, I'm not contributing to society. And I think I had to work through that and get to a place where I started to have more of a growth mindset about discipline. I agree with Matt there. Like, I think I had to work some of those muscles and then also make sure I was focusing on the things that I wanted to focus on and not get attracted to shiny objects especially when you're not working, like opportunities can come up where you can make a little bit of money, but you, 
but I didn't really want to do that. You see a YouTube advertisement for like drop shipping. And I'd be like, should I get into drop shipping? That seems like these people are really, you know, making money. And I was like, that doesn't, I could just go back to my old job if I want to do something like stupid to make money. So I think you go through all of these cycles and I think it's normal and it's okay too, if you don't jump out of your sabbatical and everything isn't perfect, um, you sort of figure it out on your way down, I think. And speaking of money, I also wanted to ask a question that's been coming up a lot, sort of around money and like financial preparation. And also part of that, how do you go into a sabbatical where you're not making money? And does your mindset change? Um, I think people are very interested to know from the panel, like what's your, how did your relationship with money change? How did you prepare for your sabbatical? Um, and maybe if there's anything that you would do differently too. You don't have to answer all those questions, but if one of those stick out. <laughs> I can offer some thoughts. So I think one thing is everyone's money relationship is personal. Uh, so I think thinking about sabbaticals, quitting your job and self-employment is a great opportunity to really reflect on what that relationship is. Some people need a million dollars to feel comfortable. Some people need 3000. I've met and been close to both of those kinds of people. And I think those emotions and experiences are real, right? Um, so it's like figuring out what kind of person you are. I think for me, um, I was shocked at how quickly my uh, value of time um, became much more valuable to me um, relative to before. Uh, I think after I quit my job, I was willing to spend a lot of my personal savings to buy my time because I realized I needed to like find a different way of orienting in the world. And it was going to be hard, confusing and take a long time, which I think for me really took like three to four years of like on and off sabbaticals, creative experiments, all these things. Um, and most of the most people drastically reduce their spending very quickly as soon as they stop having an income coming in. Uh, and I think it surprises most people as well. <laughs> it surprised me. I went from like spending 6,500 a month in New York to less than a thousand a month. Um, but yeah, you also realize like if you needed money, you would take all sorts of random jobs because you're willing to work in different ways and you're not just thinking about work in one kind of way. Uh, so for me, I sort of thought my, I saw my time in years when I quit my job, I didn't find any work for three months. I then did like five or six months of consulting projects and made about like 40 to 50 grand. And I'd gotten my cost of living in Boston down to like 30 grand a year, like really aggressively cutting. And when I made 40 to 50 in that first nine months, I said, okay, I'm going to give myself permission to take some time off now and not worry about money. I had some savings other than that, but I didn't want to like spend down that savings. I think by the end of that year, I was a bit negative from when I started. Um, but yeah, it, it's really hard. You should never listen to what anyone else is saying about their relationship because ultimately you need to interrogate your own money and securities and figure out what works for you. I've seen people thrive on making $10,000 a year and also thrive on making $500,000 a year. You got to figure out who you are. Hard to follow that, Paul. That was brilliant. <laughs> um, I, yeah, so I completely, completely agree with this. Um, interestingly, I think my story is quite different, so probably worth sharing bits of it. I ended up spending more on sabbatical than I was when I was working, not less, uh, not that much more, but still, um, yeah. The interesting bit is that my relationship with money definitely had to shift even before I went on sabbatical. It was part of my my journey before I made the decision to go, because before like past me would kind of look at money as a way to almost protect my future self. It's like, here's a pot of money that I'm building. If my future self has issues, then this pot of money is meant to be there and to sort her problems out. Great. The problem is you could, that pot of money then 
in, in, that, in that frame, that pot of money needs to sort out every single problem that you have in the future, right? So it's never big enough because you could imagine loads of problems that happen in the future. So for me, it was important that that pot of money stay protected. So for a lot of my career, I built that up, but I never spent it on myself in the moment. It was all for my future self. Um, and taking a sabbatical for me to take a sabbatical and to use up that pot of money, my mindset had to shift from, I am building up this pot of money to protect my future self to, I am using this pot of money to invest in myself and invest in this sabbatical, which I am taking a bet on is going to be a transformational experience for me. It's like, I kind of describe it a bit as how companies spend money in R&D, right? You spend money on R&D projects. Some of them are going to fail, probably a lot of them. Some of them are going to turn out really good. You don't know which ones, but you have to go for it and you have to put money, invest time, money, energy into it to figure out where, where they lead you. And for me, it was it was really that shift moving from investing in my future self to investing in my present self to figure out what I wanted to do now and how I wanted to consciously shape the next phase of my life. That's that's where the shift happened. And my money then served me on sabbatical. It it was it was an interesting shift. And now I haven't shifted back even now that I've returned back to work, which is also interesting. Uh, actually, Phil, I'm glad you also brought up shifting back to work because that has been a question that hasn't come up so much in the chat, but has come up in the when people are signing up for Luma. Um, for any of you guys who are shifting back to any type of work, um, you know, making money, freelancing full time, is there any advice or anything that happened that was unexpected that came from transitioning from a sabbatical to back to like making money and being in a non sabbatical mode, I guess? I was surprised at how driven I was to do it. Uh, I had no experience working on my own or doing any, like I did some entrepreneurial stuff when I was younger and on the side, but never in a way that I could pay for my um, uh, living. When I found things I actually like doing, the motivation to stay on this weird path and have more time abundance was so powerful that like it, it, it I totally underestimated that. And I think before you quit your job, you're only afraid of like, well, how will I make money? And it's like, yeah, you, you don't know. But then you, the thing about emerging out of a sabbatical and shifting into work is you get to see what you're made of. Uh, I did all sorts of work experiments and I, I realized quickly that I don't want to work full time in an office, but there's like thousands of ways of working and I don't need to be super successful or special. Um, I'll work in a restaurant if I need to, or work in a bar. Like you can make like enough money doing some of these things. I'll jump in as well. I think returning. So I'm, I'm probably, so I'm returned to work as in, uh, not a full-time job, but I returned to a form of work that resembled quite closely what, on the face of it, resembles quite closely what I used to do before. So I went back to work um, four days a week in the same company as the company that I left before I went on sabbatical. And in probably the one role that I was interested in, if that had been any other role, I wouldn't have gone back. But I went back four days a week um, very intentionally because I wanted to protect the kind of the new person that I had built up while on sabbatical and I knew I knew I worried that if I returned back to a full-time job my old self might reignite itself and I might not resist that you know it's a well-practiced old self it's you know for 12 years it had been working really intensely being really driven and in meaningful directions or what felt like meaningful directions so I was like mm, I'm not gonna you know push it too hard I actually want to do this job but I want to do it on my terms. So I went back four days a week rather than five. And it made it a lot more easy for me to set boundaries around it and not spend evenings uh, working or weekends or whatever. So, so that, was, uh, that was one thing that I think is 
really made a big difference for me. And the other thing is, when I actually did go back to work, oh, yeah, to be fair, when I came back from nomading in, into London, that was already kind of like a returning from sabbatical thing. And then when I went from sabbatical back into work, there was another returning from sabbatical experience. Both of those things, honestly, I found really hard. Um, they, there, were, there were some moments when I was returning where I felt like this is actually... <laughs> This is this is one of the crucial parts of the journey because you're kind of reintegrating or I was reintegrating all of the new things that had come up, but reintegrating them in the society that I had left and I cared about. I care about London. I want to live. there. How do I figure out how to live there with the new self that I've developed? So it was there was a lot of friction and it was really a really interesting exercise for me to try and figure out, OK, what do I put up with? What do I not put up with and set my boundary and then act in a different way to how I acted before and at work the kind of stuff that was hard for me and it took me probably I don't know three months of going of being back at work to start calming my nervous system almost that was like constantly activating like no I don't want to do this this is not what I <laughs> this is not what I came back for but it by setting my boundaries again, day after day and saying, no, I'm not doing this. This is not of interest or no, I'm not doing this in that way. I was kind of expressing my new self day after day and practicing being myself in a more, in a stronger and stronger way. The kind of stuff that was hard was like being directed again, like on sabbatical, I worked quite a bit on my own stuff, but I did it when I wanted, I worked on, on what I wanted back at work. There are things that you don't want to do, but you have to do. So right which ones matter and then I will do them which ones I feel like mm, actually those ones no they won't and then I won't do them and the other thing that weirdly was difficult for me is um I ended up not knowing how to I realized I had forgotten how to switch tasks <laughs> when I was on sabbatical and you go into writing mode or I went into writing mode I would focus on this for like two hours four hours six hours whatever multiple days of that week and go like yeah this is what I'm doing this week you go back at work and one day you're writing for an hour, you're in a meeting, then you're on a call and then you're whatever, you're doing something else and you're kind of switching between topics and people constantly. And that's a muscle that had atrophied during my sabbatical because I was much, much more mono-focused mono than I used to be. But interestingly, no, for me, no skills were lost. I know that's a big question that comes up as well. What happens if I go back and I've actually lost the skills that I used to have and I can't function anymore at work I didn't lose any of it or honestly if I did I, I got them back really quickly in a month the one skill I did lose was putting up with bullshit <laughs> that that I did lose it completely and I did not get used to it again so even now this is actually helpful because it helps me say no to things that I feel are not worth doing but yeah I've not regained that skill that's something that is lost in the ether. <laughs> I, I, I feel that to be true, Cecile. <laughs> um, I want to be really respectful of everyone's time. I know we're on the hour and we have only booked you guys for an hour. So if you need to leave, feel, feel, please feel free to. Um, it was really great having all of you guys here. I will have the panel. They can stay for a little bit longer, um, but it was really great to see the chat, even to hear your stories. And so, yes, if you need to leave, feel free to, and we'll be sending out this recording afterwards as well. Um, for the people who are here for the panel, who have been chatting, um, I know you've been seeing some of the stuff in the chat and the questions. Obviously, we haven't got to all of them, but I'm curious if there was any questions that you wanted to answer or something that stuck out, um, let me know. I think that might be a great place to sort of start this over time. I'll give you guys a second to look too. Or if there's anything that you wish someone asked and we didn't talk about. Yeah, very open to some conversation with the entire group. So do do shout out um, comments. It doesn't have to be questions, like comments on your own experience. And I'll just use that as a as a prompt, no, Michelle, to thank you very much for your, your facilitation of this entire thing. It was brilliantly done. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I, you know, something that stood out to me um, that we were talking about, I, it kind of came up a little bit and it can, someone mentioned something similar in the chat, but I wonder if your relationship to 
giving and receiving, like generosity as a whole, had changed throughout your experience? Um, I, I know it has for me, and I'm just curious to hear if that, if you've noticed any similar changes um, or if you know, nothing changed in yourselves. Yeah, actually, I was, I've been thinking about this recently. Um, I was doing yoga on Monday, and I was talking to a friend about my sublet situation in New York and how this friend is being very kind to me and letting me stay at his apartment for only $500 a month in New York. And I was just like feeling very uh, grateful for this friend. And then this this girl who was in a yoga class overheard us and she was somewhat of a, like a, a hippie and had a bunch of tattoos. And no, like I said, it's all in, with love. And she was like, she just like whispers to us. She's like, generosity is a form of currency. And I've been thinking about that now. Um, but yeah, it's it's kind of weird to think about because I feel like I've been more generous now that I've left. And the weird, the really weird thing is without getting to details, I feel like I'm even more financially generous than when I was making a lot of money. It's like, it, it kind of screws my mind a lot. Um, Cause I've seen how, how I'm still the same person, but my mind has changed so much. Um, and then also I'm just m way more generous with my time because when I was working all my free time was, I was able to translate it into dollars per hour but also because I needed more rest and sort of like cope coping time from the job. And so perfect example is yesterday morning, I wake up, there's this Twitter DM from this guy who's a current student at my alma mater. He's like, hey, I know this is short notice, but by 7 p.m. I have to decide if I'm gonna take a gap semester, can we talk? And he's like, I'm deciding whether to pursue a side project. And in my last blog, I said I took a gap semester. So that's why he reached out. Basically called him for 45 minutes in the afternoon got talking, um, I could tell I was helping him sort of unblock himself and um, felt good to just give my time. And, I, and at the end, he was very grateful. Um, so just things like that have been happening, which has been cool to see. Also a little bit like disheartening that uh, before, I, before I went on sabbatical, I was, I was not as generous. <laughs> yeah, this changed so dramatically for me. <laughs> It was actually something I really leaned into in the first couple of years after quitting my job. I read a book by uh, Charles Eisenstein to Sacred Economics, which I highly recommend. It talks about the gift economy. And I was just in total rejection of my past life. And I think part of me, my past self, I wasn't a generous person in the career world. Um, and I basically decided I wanted to like devote more time to helping people I had like hundreds of calls with people. I would just open up my calendar every week and pretty much talk to anyone. Um, and I started giving financial gifts to people, like just random strangers and people on the internet supporting people's things. And like, I would do it to like test my own insecurity with money. And it basically just made me more comfortable. And then the more I talked about my insecurity and what I was making, like less than 30 grand a year, my first few years, like more people would help me. And the generous people started showing up. And I was like, well, I want to be a generous person like them. And like, it just brought my attention to create this much more positive cycle and also lean into those friends that supported me, especially in those first couple of years, whether they let me stay at their home and um, supported me financially like, I mean, I was in this cohort of MBA students from MIT and everyone's crushing it and making a lot of money. And it was kind of embarrassing for me to like, oh, stay on somebody's couch or like take a meal. But I really just learned to receive that. And I think I still need to like figure out how to be bolder with it now as I start to make more money. Like, how can I do this for other people? Um, and it's something I'm thinking about a lot, but uh it's really changed the way I think about money and has helped me spend a lot more free or two. Yeah, I'm very similar to Matt and Paul. I didn't even realize it at first, but I was both more generous with my time, I think to some extent my money, but like I had more time than money to give. And also at receiving, um, which I think is part of it. Like I think the receiving aspect and seeing how my friends would look out for me or people would just be very considerate or I don't know I think I my mindset ended up being very positive so I felt like also more like gifts were coming into my life 
And I, I shifted my mindset instead of being like, oh, I don't need this. Or like sometimes having pride around it or feeling like it had to be reciprocated. I just kind of opened myself to being more open if something came my way and found that I also really enjoy giving back to people as well. Um, I think it was something that kind of when I reflect like in the corporate world, especially since I was in sales, it wasn't really ever rewarded. And in fact, sometimes if you're really generous with your time or you give a lot of yourself, people are just really, it just feels a little bit more, you can get taken advantage of, or it doesn't work out for you, or people will tell you to look out for yourself a lot in the corporate world. And so I think what really shifted for me was that when I was, it was just me and my success and everything I was doing was just based on myself. I was like much more excited to give more and like give more of my time. And then it's been really cool to see how that like comes back. Like, I think that if you have a generous spirit, like the universe is generous to you as well. I don't know if um, the rest of you guys have anything to add to that, or if there were any questions that you, that stuck out that you guys wanted to specifically answer. Um, there isn't a question, but I feel like there's a whole like spectrum of managing the emotions during the sabbatical. That could be fun to talk about. Um, I feel like there's, for me personally, like I feel like going on a sabbatical is kind of like a journey of like, being observant of your emotions and just also managing them. And so, you know, there's moments where you feel like, you know, enthusiastic and very sort of empowered that, you know, that you're able to spend your time however you want and they're able to like follow your passions or creativity. But there's also times when you're kind of dealing with the identity loss, potentially you're dealing with the, you know, lack of direction or feeling, um, you know, some sort of uh, confusion about even internally, um, and even if even when you know it's going to happen, it can still be tricky to deal with. Um, and then I, I just think it's it's obviously it manifests in different ways for people. Um, but I think that at least for me, it's it's quite an important part of the journey. Like trying to, I, I feel very much more aware of my emotions and also the things I need to do to unblock and get away from like negative ones. And you know, like there's times when I feel anxious and I'm like, oh, like I'm trying to write, so I'm trying to do something. And like, I know now I need to like stop and just like go outside, especially if there's sun. Like if there's, I'm a tropical baby, I need sun or like, you know, I just need like a breeze or something. Um, that's something I didn't know my entire life. I would just try and like hustle harder to try and do the thing harder, but then I, I still feel that resistance. Um, and even times when I was talking to my writing coach the other day about how, you know, sometimes I feel, you know, so in work, you, you're playing a corporate game. There's always a game. There's always like rewards and incentives you're meant to follow. Um, and then if you're like writing or publishing, they are like in perfect proxy. So like likes or comments, which are obviously like poor indicators of like the depth or resonance of a piece. But sometimes you can feel, or I can feel like a part of myself being like, oh, like I want to check like a like or something. I want to see how many, how well this post is doing. And like I was talking to my writing coach about this and she just kind of mentioned that I should write like a letter to that person and just like, like, hey, you're, I know you're trying to help me, but you're actually not helping me and just like name the person. And, and I feel like that that was a very helpful uh, uh, practice for me, just being able to, you know, not try and sh like hide from it and just actually, um, be like, hey, like I know this is a person that comes up every now and then and is trying, it has good intentions, but ends up um, making me potentially feel more anxious. And that actually leads to less good writing and gets in the way. So yeah, I wonder if you guys have any other reflections on the sort of um, emotional journey or like um, part of this. Uh, lots, lots I could comment on, but I just want to keep it short on one thing. I think one of the tough things about the sabbatical is to what you said, Toby, of like noticing how people make you feel when you're on this uncertainty journey, you start to pick up on um, how supportive your friends are or not supportive. And the best way I, try to attune myself is how do I feel after the conversation? Did they give me energy or did they drain my energy? And one of the, I guess, more unfortunate sad things is realizing that I should distance myself or put in less effort to certain friendships. But at the same time, it's not like I'm net negative on uh, fulfillment in relationships because I found new friends and new people that support me. 
But yeah, one of the tough things to sort of deal with is this transition where you realize, oh, these friends from high school, these college friends, like they're actually, they may not actually be, uh, these friendships may not be serving me in the same way as before. Yeah, just a quick one to jump in. I think it's a really good point that you're making, Toby. The emotional journey is, for me, it's been a deepening into it and a deepening into um, feeling into the various emotions that come up here and there. And I can very much see a difference between my past self pre-sabbatical that now feels like she was more of a, a number version of myself where in order to survive corporate life and the intensity, you have to numb yourself in some way, otherwise it becomes overwhelming, or at least that's how I seem to have done it. And going through the sabbatical meant that I was taking off those layers one after the other, and I was denumbing myself in a way, which meant that I did feel more, emotions felt more raw, um, and sometimes more difficult to manage. But if you learn to sit with them and process them then then for me it's led to I'd say a more a more vibrant way of living compared to what my way of living felt like before I'd gone on sabbatical yeah I think that's the key thing I hear from people over and over again and I've experienced is that the hard thing to convey is this is not like a mathematical equation you can figure out on a spreadsheet i experienced this psychological richness and a different way of being um at before and after these breaks and non-work experiments and quitting my job and that's never going to show up enough um to convey that to other people i think it will convey to some people and you'll really resonate with those people but some it's going to be invisible to some people and that is what makes it so hard, but is also what makes it worth it. And I think if you are experiencing this, like, okay, something is off. A sabbatical is like the most powerful psychotechnology uh, for the modern, like educated worker. Uh, three months in 500 months of adult working life, and it might change your life and make it dramatically better, or at least more psychologically um, enriching. And it's like, why, why not try to do these things <laughs> at minimum? Like we'll think you're cool. Um, and the, the hard thing for me, like, I'm so grateful for people like Toby, Cecile, Matt, and Michelle is like, I, I just feel less crazy now in 2017. This was so hard for me. I felt like a great, like just such a, like, what am I doing? How do I convey this to other people? And finding the others has been so important to me. Um, so yeah, reach out, let me know how you're reflecting and share with these people too. I think, um, all of these guys have done such a great job and I look forward to their future books, sharing their journeys too. I think that's a great note to end this on. Thank you, Matt, Cecile, Paul, Toby for coming, for having this conversation. Thank you all of you for staying late. Thanks for everyone who joined today. Thanks for everyone who's watching the recording. Um, it's been a really, really positive experience, at least on my end. And it's been very cool to see people share their stories in the chat as well. Um, write about these topics. I think all of us are always really interested in reading about other people's sabbaticals, time off, the journeys that they go into. And it's been really amazing. Thank you guys for joining today and enjoy the rest of your week. Thanks for hosting the show. You killed it.